Okay, so we're starting our new unit on cognition, which is all about memory um, and how we process memories, how we remember information, why we don't remember information, things like that. Um, so you are going to be, uh, first there's a quick check-in, just let me know how you're doing. Then there are um, a lot of notes, it looks like. It's just, there's a lot of terms. Um, so it's just a little bit of writing from the slides. And then the last part is there's a check for understanding that is a couple multiple choice questions. And then um, there is an FRQ. I'll go over those as we get closer to that. But first I'm just gonna go through the notes. Sorry if you can hear my dog clomping around in the background with his cast leg. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go right to the notes. So memory is the persistence of learning over time through the encoding, storage, and retrieval of information. Basically what this is saying is it's the things that we remember over a long period of time. And we do this through these three different things. So these three processes are encoding, storage, and retrieval. I feel like the last two kind of make sense, but we'll go through all of them. So encoding is the process of getting info into our memory system. So it's just basically how we get it in, how we process it. Storage is pretty simply put, it's how we retain it, where, where it goes, how we keep it in there so we can eventually retrieve it, um, which is the process of getting it out. So all these things are happening um, constantly when we're getting information out and some of this retrieval happens automatically, some of it we have to think about. And sometimes we can't get it out because there's errors in these processes. And we'll talk about that um, in a later lesson about what happens when the encoding goes wrong or when the storage isn't there or when we just can't get it out. So um, there have been theories about how we process information and one of them is called the three-stage info processing model. It's also called the uh, atkinson Schifrin model. Those are just the two guys who created it. Basically it says we first record to be remembered info as a fleeting sensory memory. So we're like, huh, here's something that I've learned. It is this quick little thing, we remember that. Then from there, we process the info into short-term memory. And we're gonna talk about short-term memory in a second because not everybody thinks of short-term memory the same anymore, um, where we encode it through rehearsal. Finally, info moves into long-term memory for later retrieval. So some people said, I think short-term memory isn't the right way to say it because that makes it sound like it just is, it's there and then just disappears. And that's not exactly what's happening. So some people said, let's call it working memory. And this is a newer understanding of short-term memory that focuses on conscious active processing of incoming auditory and visual spatial info, meaning um, sound and images, and info retrieved from long-term memory. So they're saying it's actually going through, like we're, we're processing it. There's active stuff happening going on here. And sometimes not all of it gets into long-term memory, but some of it does. So that's working memory, it's working. Um, so there's different types of processing. And so we have effortful and automatic. I think it's pretty obvious, but effortful means you're, you're it's processing that requires attention. There's conscious effort going into it. Whereas automatic is, it happens just automatically. It's unconscious encoding of incidental info, such as space, time, and frequency, and of well-learned info, such as word meanings. It's like, when somebody says, hey, good morning to you, you don't have to think about what does this mean? Why are they saying this? I've never, like, you're like, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I hope your morning is going well too. It's automatic. You understand what hello or good morning means. Um, so automatic processing, again, it happens unconsciously, whereas effortful requires some attention. Um, we have to think about it. Um, for example, like studying for a test or remembering remembering a new term. You have to think about what that means. So there's different types of memory, and we're going to break it down by looking at the left first and then the right. So we have echoic, echoic, and then iconic. Echoic is basically just uh, remembering um, sensory memory of auditory stimuli, so things that we hear. Um, echo, like when I hear the word if I see the word echo, I think of a sound. Um, and this is basically, um, it says, if your attention is elsewhere, sounds or words can still be recalled within three to four seconds. So you can still recall them pretty quickly. Um, iconic memory is similar to that, but it's with visual information and um, a photographic or picture image memory lasting no more than a few tenths of a second. So it's really quick. Um, then on the other side, we have explicit and implicit memory. Um, these two these two terms, echoic and iconic, don't come up as much, but they, they do every now and then. 
explicit and implicit do come up more often. So explicit memory is memory of facts and experiences that one can consciously know and declare. So it's things that you are like, explicit means to be very um, purposeful. It means to say very like exactly. Um, if I was saying I'm being explicit with my instructions, I'm saying I'm telling you exactly what to do. Implicit, you have to make some um, you have to kind of more unconsciously think about the things or it's implied, right? So um, implicit memory is retention independent of conscious recollection. So the difference between an explicit and an implicit memory would be, for example, um, an implicit memory would be like, let's say you're a teenager, right? And you hop on your bike to, to ride it somewhere. You're not like, okay, my this thing goes, like, if you've been riding your bike for a long time, you know how to ride a bike. Or like, when you get in a car, I think this is maybe one of the multiple choice questions, you get in a car and you put your keys in the ignition and then you start driving. Like at first, that was something that you had to learn how to do. But after doing it for, I mean, like I think about myself, I've been driving for 12, 13 years now. I I don't have to think about where does the where does the key go? How do I shift? Like, what do my feet do? I just, I know how to do that. I don't have to think about it. But at first I did have to do that. And that would be an explicit memory. Um, or like if you're going to a new place and you have to explicitly think about it. Whereas if you're like just going to school, which you do every day, you probably don't really think about it that much. You just kind of have that memory of what you do there. So that's the difference between those two. Um, so we have some things that help us with memory. Um, so the first is chunking, which is organizing items into familiar manageable units. And it often occurs automatically. Our brain likes to put things into smaller little pieces so we can remember it better. Um, this is like, you can see this a lot of times with numbers. Um, I think about like, like a phone number or a credit card. They, they don't just put all the numbers together. They put them into little chunks. Like you have the area code, then you have the first three numbers, then you have the last four numbers. Um, they do that so it's, it's easier to memorize these things. Nowadays, we don't, obviously we don't need to memorize phone numbers as much anymore, but back in the day when he didn't have smartphones or things, like you had to remember, you had to remember somebody's phone number if you wanted to call them. Um, and that was an easier way to do it. Same with like a credit card. Um, they didn't used to like store everything on, like I know now I can go on my phone, it automatically remembers everything, but uh, you would have to memorize it. And that's why it's chunked into these smaller pieces. Um, mnemonics, we've talked about mnemonics a little bit before, but they're memory aids, um, especially techniques that use like images or organizational devices. Um, I always think of like when you learn the directions, right? Like Northeast, Southwest. Um, for me, I learned that as never eat soggy waffles. That was a thing that helped me remember that that's a mnemonic. And you can do this for anything. Like if we are learning about like different parts of the brain, you could be like, like, I remember, I think I said this earlier, but like the amygdala. And for me, I was like, oh, the amygdala, Amy, I see the word Amy in it. And my mom's name is Amy. My mom is really emotional and sometimes gets angry. So that's how I remember the amygdala deals with emotions, especially anger. That's how I remember it. That is a mnemonic for me. Um, and you, these are best when they relate directly to you, but sometimes they could just be things like the never eat soggy waffles or whatever you learn to remember the directions. And then we have hierarchies, which is pretty much just, I mean, you know what a hierarchy is. Um, it's just broad concepts divided and then subdivided into narrower concepts. So it's like you have kind of like a, like a, a web of things, like you have something at the top and then you have like two things below it and then you break them down into other chunks. Just to be like, okay, like, this is the frontal lobe. These are the things that then are part of the frontal lobe. These are the things that are smaller than that or whatever it might be. So um, there's, we're gonna talk more about like things that help with memory and things that affect our memory more. Um, but there's this thing called the spacing and the testing effect. And basically the spacing effect says the tendency for distributed study or practice to yield better long-term retention than is achieved through mass study or practice. Basically says, don't cram everything into one do it over time. I think you've heard that from all of your teachers, but it's true. Um, don't study everything the night before the test because it's not gonna get into your long-term uh, memory. It's just gonna be that short-term and sometimes that short-term isn't gonna work for you. Um, and then the testing effect says, enhance memory after retrieving rather than simply rereading info. Saying that, 
the best way to kind of help remember information is to test yourself on it, um, to do practice examples, to do things like that, rather than just being like, oh, I'll just reread the chapter again. That might not help. It might just do the same thing that you've done before. But if you read the chapter, then take some practice questions about it and then come back to it, that might actually help you remember it. So that is it for this first intro unit, our first intro lesson on cognition. There is a video here that goes over this info. Um, it's a crash course. It goes pretty quick, but it gets to, into everything um, in a pretty engaging way. You don't have to watch it, but if you want to, it is there for you. So the last two parts of today's lesson is the multiple choice. So just highlight your correct answers. Uh, there's only five. And then there's an FRQ. Um, the FRQ is pretty simple. There's only two terms, implicit and explicit memory. So make sure you just define each term, explain how it's connected to the prompt, and then bold and underline the term when you use it. That is it for today. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And um, yeah.